Okay, so what I'm going to do is that I'm going to start by briefing, giving like a very brief uh, outline uh, for the lectures when I'm listing some relevant references. And then I will spend most of today's lecture going through like one example, like without any formalism, like in detail. And I will use this example to motivate what the rest of the lectures will be about. Uh, so the outline is going to be a bit, a bit vague because I think it will be easier to understand once we go through uh, one example. Um, so in these lectures, we're going to be interested in uh, so quantum lattice models. So these are quantum theories that are defined on lattices. And I will be focusing probably exclusively on one plus one dimensional models, so like a 1D uh, lattice. Um, and so in this context, you have degrees of freedom that are localized at specific points of your lattice, let's say on the, on the sides or maybe on, on the links. We can assign, we will assign some Hibbert space that will describe the space of, of states, some algebra of operators acting on these degrees of freedom. And finally, we will specify what we call a Hamiltonian, which will encode the dynamics of the, of the theory. Okay. And so we will uh, be specifically interested in two, uh, two aspects of these quantum lattice models, uh, so symmetries and dualities. And I will be, uh, so today in particular, I will try to refine a little bit what we mean by symmetry and, and, and duality. But loosely speaking, a symmetry is some kind of transformations which act on the whole Hibbert space of the system, leaving it invariant. And in particular, this is an operator that will commute with, uh, with the Hamiltonian. A duality, on the other hand, is some kind of transformation which will change the theory. It will change in particular the Hamiltonian, like transmute it into another one. Uh, and you can, by applying a duality, you can end up with a, like, very different looking theories, but we will, I will, will, uh, I will explain in which way they can actually be, uh, related. Uh, so just to illustrate, so a prototypical example of, uh, duality, and to some extent we can think of all the others as some kind of wild generalizations of this one, is the so-called, uh, kramers vanier duality. So it was in 1941. And so this is the example we will review uh, today in, in detail. Um, another example I want to mention of a duality which came uh, much later, which was due to Pasquier, was the so-called IRF vertex correspondence. Um, which has a different uh, flavor. But the formalism uh, employed in order to so IRF refers to interaction around the face model and vertex model. So it was a, a correspondence between statistical mechanical models. And the formalism that was employed in, in this paper is, uh, well, it's a precursor of what we're going to use um, uh, in these lectures. There was a generalization uh, of, of this correspondence by Roche. So a couple of years later. And this generalization was using something called the Ockneanu cell calculus. So which was developed roughly around the same time by Ockneanu in the, in the 90s. And uh, more recently, this type, uh, so the, the technology used in developing this, this dualities correspondence was revisited uh, in a paper and uh, extended to some extent by Essen, Fenley, and Monk. Another example I want to highlight, uh, which was of a different flavor and to some extent was not really covered by the, the technology employed in developing this, uh, this correspondence, was the so-called uh, Kennedy-Tasaki duality, which we will also discuss in some details, but not today. In, in 92. And so in this lecture, I will present a framework to study symmetries and study dualities in lattice models. And in particular, this framework will recover these uh, historical, um, I would say, uh, examples. And um, the way we're going to do that, the we're going to do that in a way that puts much more emphasis on the role that this model, the, on the role of the symmetries uh, in these models. And in particular, we're going to exploit uh, a modern viewpoint on symmetry, which was formalized uh, 10 years ago, so under the name of generalized symmetry. So 
So by guy auto, capristing, cyborg and willet, and 40. And so loosely speaking, the idea here is to uh, draw a correspondence between the presence of a symmetry in a quantum theory and the existence of uh, topological defects. So the keyword here is topological. This implies in particular that many techniques that have been developed over past decades to study topological quantum field theory can be leveraged in order to study symmetry in, I would say, general uh, quantum theories. And these techniques, they have a strong uh, category theoretic flavor. And we will be employing uh, th these techniques in, uh, uh, in these lectures. And actually, so this viewpoint has, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's currently a very, uh, uh, a very busy area of research. There is a lot of the literature is, is growing uh, every day. And I would like to highlight uh, three papers where they employ this uh, viewpoint on symmetry in order to treat, uh, so to treat symmetries. So for instance, to consider some kind of gauging procedure of these symmetries in a way that is analogous to the way we're going to do it. So as I said, there are hundreds of, of, of papers exploiting this correspondence. I'm just going to highlight three of them, which are uh, close in spirit to what I'm going to talk about. So there is a paper by Tashikawa and Barwaj. From 21. By Fried, Moore, and Telemann. And Gayoto and Kulp. So all these, uh, so these three papers, but also most of the literature on this subject, is in the continuum. And to some extent, the goal of these lectures is to propose a lattice realization uh, of this program, or rather to show you. Uh, so we've we've already proposed this lattice realization, and I'm going to present it uh, in these lectures. And so this uh, this work. I'm going to, to present in these lectures. It was done in collaborations with uh, Lawrence Lutens, Gerardo Ortiz on one paper, and Frank Gerstrater. So we have a series of three papers published from 21 to 23. Um, and so this is essentially these lectures, so it's uh, loosely based on this. Uh, uh, on these three papers. Something I want to highlight uh, right away is the fact that this uh, point of view, so exploiting this correspondence between symmetry and topological defects and the corresponding sort of um, mathematical machinery uh, pertaining to category theory, has the massive advantage of working in any dimension, provided that you have a, a, a good enough uh, understanding of the corresponding, I would say, uh, category theoretical structures, it applies in any dimension. I would say in sharp contrast with these earlier um, sort of proposals that were very much based on like integrability, it was often very closely related to notion of integrability, it was very uh, one plus one dimensional specific, but this more modern approach works in any dimension. And there are, we've already, uh, so in a paper with a proof theory, we already proposed uh, a higher dimension generalization of what I'm going to present in these lectures. Okay, so that was for the brief uh, literature review. And now I will so go through uh, one example, so in detail, and uh, hopefully it will, uh, from this example, it will be clear what is the goal of, this, uh, of these lectures. So the example we're gonna talk about, this is the first one I mentioned above. So prototypical example of a correspondence, a duality between lattice models is this kramers vanier duality. Uh, and you can, in principle, apply it to well, an infinite number of, of models, but we're going to do it in the case of uh, the transverse field IZ model, which is the example it was first uh, derived from. Okay. So the transverse field IZ model.
So for now, I'm going to define the model. This is the way it was uh, done uh, historically. I'm going to work on uh, the maybe not so physical setup where we have an infinite, uh, the lattice is an infinite one dimensional lattice. So I'm going to call this, a, uh, sometimes I will refer to this lattice as a chain. So we have an infinite one dimensional lattice, okay, it looks like this. We have sites and I will be labeling the sites with integers. So sometimes uh, we need to refer to the links or rather if you want to the sites that are in between two other sites, in that case, correspondingly, I will label them by half integers. So the degrees of freedom of this system, let's go spin one half degrees of freedom at every side. So what it means, it means that the local, we have a local uh, vector space associated with every side, which is just a copy of C2. So everything will be over complex numbers. So the Hilbert space, the total Hilbert space of the system is just a tensor product space. Um, of the local Hilbert spaces. Okay, so over all the sites. So acting on these degrees of freedom, we have a matrix algebra of operators. which is generated by Pauli operators. So by that I mean you can take any products, you can multiply by some uh, complex numbers, these operators. And so two of them, uh, the first one, I'm going to write it sigma x. It is an operator that flips a spin. So we have a two-dimensional Hilbert space. We have the configurations how the spin one half can either be up or down. This is an operator that is going to uh, swap uh, between up and down. And we have another operator which measures the spin. Sigma z operator, it measures the spin. These operators, they satisfy the so defining property is the algebra they satisfy, which is the following one. So first of all, they square, both of them square to the identity. And also the anti-commute. Okay. So let me at this point introduce a notation that we will use uh, throughout is in order to refer to the operator acting at a given site. So I will write, for instance, sigma i x. And by that I mean the operator where it's the identity of everywhere, but at the site i where it acts with party x. Okay. And so, in that spirit, with this notation, I can write down, so since operators acting at different sites will obviously commute, we have this sort of slightly more general commutation relation, which is of this form. So, so operators X and Z, they will commute if they act on different sites, but if they, are, if they act at the same sites, then they will uh, intercommute. Okay, so now uh, the basis I'm going to use, so I can, I can define the basis I'm going to use uh, with these operators. So I'm choosing C2 to be the span of basis vectors that I use the ket uh, notation that are labeled by 0 and 1, where 0 is the plus 1 eigenstate of the sigma z operator, and one is the minus one eigenstate. 
Okay? So in this basis, uh, uh, the Pauli uh, matrices, sigma x reads this, and sigma z is just 1, 0, minus 1. So unless I, I indicate otherwise, we will always be working in this, uh, in this Pauli z basis. OK, so finally, I can write down the Hamiltonian, which encodes the dynamics of this model. So it's a sum of local operators. Depends on one parameter, kappa. So this is the way I'm writing this Hamilton. So there is a constant here, kappa. And so the first thing uh, we want to identify is the symmetry of this model. So this model, it has a Z2 symmetry. So I'm going to write Z2 like this. So Z2 symmetry, generated by the following operators. So essentially, the operator is the simultaneous flip of all the spins. And so sigma x is the operator flipping the spin. So I'm acting with the product of sigma x everywhere. And I'm calling this uh, operator eta. So this operator, in particular, commutes with the Hamiltonian. Huh? It just follows from the algebra satisfied by the Pauli operators. So here, the fact that we have a combination of these two sigma z's means that it's an even operator. So when you do the commutation relations, you have two minus ones that cancel, and this is why it, it actually commutes. OK. And so the fact that we have a symmetry already uh, gives us some information. In particular, it means we have, um, so the Hubble space and the Hamiltonian decomposes into kind of two blocks. Uh, labeled by the two E-reps of the group Z2, so an even and an odd sector. You have a natural decomposition of the Hamiltonian between even and an odd sector. OK, so that's the, the model. And now we're going to apply the so-called kramers vanier transformation to this model. So I'm going to define the kramers vanier transformation in, in various ways. I'm going to first present it the kind of the traditional way. Then I will highlight some subtleties. And ultimately, I will... Uh, we derive it uh, from a gauging point of view. OK, so the Kramers vanier transformation. So the idea underlying uh, this transformation is essentially to replace uh, spin configurations by so-called domain wall configurations. So maybe I should uh, clarify at this point that so this is the same idea uh, if you think of the statistical mechanical models, the, the classical Ising models. And generally speaking, everything we will do during these lectures uh, so I'll be focusing on one plus one dimensional uh, quantum lattice models, but the same technology could be employed to study statistical mechanical models. Um, so what do I mean by domain wall? So sometimes referred to as kinks. So let's say a, a given state of my system, uh, the basis vectors are labeled them zero and one. So a given state would look something like this. It would be a collection of of one and zeros, right? And uh, a domain wall is whenever so you have collections of like zeros and one, and whenever you flip from zeros and ones, you have a domain wall. So here, I have a domain wall here, domain wall here, 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 and here. And so the idea is that we would like to uh, write down the theory in terms of this kind of domain wall configurations rather than the spin configurations. So the first thing I need to do is to define new operators. So first, I need an operator that is going to measure, uh, that measures whether there is a domain wall. In the same spirit that we have an operator measuring whether we have a spin. 
And this new operator that I'm going to write tau z, which is going to act in between, let's say, site i and i plus 1, so i plus 1 half, I can express it in terms of the original operators. So indeed, uh, if you apply this operator on the configuration where there is a domain wall, since they are anti-aligned, you will necessarily pick up a minus sign, and therefore this operator will detect whether there is a minus sign. So the eigenvalue of this operator will be minus 1 whenever two consecutive spins are not in the same state. And I also need an operator that will, um, I will say, toggles domain walls, so whether either create or destroy a domain wall, and this can be expressed as follows, as an infinite product of operators. And so on. So if I rewrite it explicitly. Okay. So indeed the idea is that let's say I have uh, let's say I have these two spins that are aligned, I want to create a domain wall between them. So I could say, okay, I'm going to flip that spin, then it will create a domain wall, but by flipping that spin, then I'm also creating or, or destroying a domain wall between these two. So I have to keep going, and since my is infinite, we can write it down like this. Okay, and so crucially, these operators, they satisfy the same algebra as the original spin operator. So in particular, the square to the identity. And the anti-commute. Okay. So I can now rewrite my original Hamiltonian in terms of these new operators. So we have already uh, so the, this is essentially the operator that creates, uh, that measures the domain walls. And this one, we don't have it quite yet, but by combining two operators like this, we can write the original spin operator. Do you recommend us this to, to those who didn't do it as an exercise? I'm not going to do it, yes. No, sure. <laughs> yeah, you, you, can, you can verify for yourself, yes. <laughs> so let me just write down the resulting uh, Hamiltonian. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so this is the original Hamiltonian, which is similar looking. We essentially we traded the original spin operators for the domain wall operators. And this Hamiltonian, crucially, uh, it has a symmetry, which I'm going to write down with the Pondragon dual of Z2, uh, for reasons that maybe are not so relevant right now because the it's the group is easy too, but we will consider generalization later, and this is an important uh, aspect. And so this symmetry now is generated by, so the reason why I'm using the Pontagon dual, you can trace it back to the fact that the symmetry now is generated by the poly Z, well, the tau Z operator, well, before it was the sigma uh, X's. Uh, so I'm going to write it down, this. Even though this is not very important for uh, the rest of the story, here, uh, as I said, the form of the Hamiltonian is actually the same as before, if not for the fact that we kind of swapped, we traded x for z's, and the fact that the kappa is essentially in front of the wrong term. So then you can ask whenever this is self-dual, and you can see that this is self-dual whenever kappa is 1. And since, so let's say, if you assume that you have a single uh, phase transition, then this will also be the critical point of the, uh, of the model. Um, but I'm not too I'm not too concerned about about this this aspect. Okay, so now uh, as I said before, this uh, this is fine, but this is the we're working on infinite chains, which is not uh, physically friendly. You have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, uh, so there are then two options. So for what we, what it means that we want to work with a finite chain, and then there are two options. Either we can work with a finite chain that is open or we can close it uh, and work with a closed chain. And so um, I'm going to, to focus on the closed chain case, but we could address the open chain one 
uh, using similar techniques. Okay. So now I want to see how does the above derivations work on a closed chain. So I have a closed, uh, so it's a closed 1D lattice with n sides. So capital N is going to be my number of sides. Uh, so it looks something like this. I have 1, 2, and the last one is, is n. And so closing it means we are identifying the site n plus 1 with the site uh, 1. So the keyboard space now is finite dimensional. And when we consider, when we start from, let's say, an open chain and we close it, we have two options in the case of the Ising model. We can either work with what we call periodic boundary conditions or anti-periodic boundary conditions. Uh, so we will, uh, uh, I will present, uh, we, we will uh, look at both, but let me for now assume that we have periodic boundary conditions. So periodic boundary conditions means really when you, when you close your chain, the, the degrees of freedom at the site uh, n plus 1 and 1, you really say, okay, these are literally the same degrees of freedom. And periodic would mean you actually, you identify the ones that are anti-aligned instead of aligning them. So assuming periodic boundary conditions. Which concretely means, as I said, I'm, I'm saying that the the spin at the site n plus 1 is literally the same as I'm identifying with the spin at the site 1. And the Hamiltonian then is, uh, in the case of pure deep boundary condition, the Hamiltonian has exactly the same form as before. Like this. So now we want to do as before. We want to replace, uh, we want to study the model in terms of domain wall configurations rather than spin configurations. Um, so at first, everything looks fine. I can define exactly as before an operator. So I'm asking for the domain wall operators. Exactly as before, I can define an operator that measures whether I have a domain wall. This is the same as before. But if I try to create now, an if I want to write down an operator that creates a single domain wall, then I'm running into issues because the way we did it before is by exploiting the fact that we had an infinite, uh, infinite lattice. So now I can't, I can't do that anymore. What I can do, uh, on the other hand, is create a pair of domain walls operators. I could do that. But so let's, uh, let's kind of try anyway. I can, I can, can do something that is not quite what we want, but what I can do is that I can, I can try to write down an operator that creates a single domain wall, which will look like this. So it kind of looks the same at first, but now I'm stopping somewhere at some arbitrary, uh, arbitrary spin. And I'm, I'm closing it with, with an operator like this, the Tarx operator. So, Okay, this seems a little bit strange. Maybe let me, uh, there is an analogous situation that is a little bit easier to understand. Is, let's say you have the domain wall operators, so you know where you flip spins, right? You can't find it, sorry. Yeah, no, I know, this is exactly the point, is that I, I'm <laughs> cheating. This is, I can create a pair of domain wall operators, but I cannot create a single one, but I can kind of choose a reference one, which I'm fixing, and then I'm defining all the other operators with respect to this one. So the, analog the, the analogy, uh, an analogous uh, idea is, let's say you know, all the, you know whether you have domain walls everywhere. And then you want to know, you want to write down an operator that, that measures the spin. You want to be able to determine what is the spin. Uh, well, knowing the domain wall operators is not enough. But if you know one reference spin, then knowing the domain wall operators, you can deduce every other spin. So here it's kind of the same, the same idea we, we, we exploit. Um, the point of, of, of doing this, so um, let me just rewrite it down more uh, explicitly. This. Okay. The point of doing this is that in particular, if I just apply the formula, 
we find the, the following relations. If I look at the operator that creates a domain wall at the side one half, it's going to be related. I'm sorry. To the one at the side n plus one half in the following way. And this, this object here was the generator of the symmetry of the initial model. This is the eta I wrote before. So I'm going to rewrite this as follows. So as I said before, I we we, we specify the periodic boundary condition for the original spin degrees of freedom. Now I'm trying to rewrite this in terms of kind of dual variables, these domain walls, but I need to also specify a boundary condition for these dual variables. So the boundary condition here would be between, it's how do I identify the domain wall at the side one half and the domain wall at the side n plus one half. So shifted by one side. And what we see here immediately is that this identification will depend on the value of eta. So if I'm in the even sectors of my original model, such a way that eta is one, then my model has to be defined on periodic boundary conditions. But if I'm in the odd sector, it has to be anti-periodic. So we see already this interplay between sort of charge sectors, which are like in which uh, yeah, symmetry sectors of the original model you are, and the boundary conditions of the dual model. So very uh, concretely, huh, in fact, so depending on the value of eta, depending on the charge sectors, then we will have periodic or interperiodic boundary conditions. Okay. So let me, uh, I can rewrite this in a slightly different way. It means that my original model, which is defined with periodic boundary conditions, I will write this with a P, it can be either so we have two sectors that are even and odd, and we have this natural decomposition since we have a symmetry. And depending on which sectors we are, then the, the dual model uh, will be either periodic or interperiodic. But in any case, it will be even. And the reason why is because of, the, uh, is because of this relation. So my dual symmetry, as we wrote before, this symmetry dual, which is the product of all the tau z's. I just replace by this expression, sorry, one half. This is the same as the product of these sigma operators. And since we have periodic boundary conditions, this will all cancel two by two. And therefore, we are forced here to be uh, in the even sector of this symmetry. Okay, so this is why this one has to be even. Okay. So let me uh, kind of rephrase a little bit uh, in a slightly different language what we, uh, what we just saw. Uh, at the end of the day, the kramers vanier duality, it is a map between so our original Hibbert space and I can, think I can define like a dual Hibbert space, which is which is isomorphic, but we know the degrees of freedom located at the, at the half integer sites. And what it does in particular, this uh, Kramers value duality, if I look at the way the, the dual Hamiltonians are mapped onto each other, so we saw it takes this operator, send it to tau z, and it sends this operator. And actually, nowadays, we often define Kramers Vanier as whatever is the operation that does this specific mapping of operators. This is, you can take this as a definition. And now the question we ask is, so uh, I'm, I'm rephrasing a bit what we did before, is can, can this mapping be unitary or invertible? So is it possible to have an operation that does this mapping and at the same time, which is invertible, which is what we typically, uh, this is what we anticipate with the notion of duality. That would be some kind of invertible relation relating uh, the models. So this is not possible, 
but so so the argument so which is similar to what I used already so supposing uh, let's suppose that it is then it means that it would act so I could I would be able I would act on uh, a given operator so let's say the symmetry operator as follows by conjugation so I'm just rewriting explicitly what it is okay so I'm, it would act in the way I described uh, over here so like this you know as before this would cancel two by two therefore this would be the identity uh, but since I'm assuming this is invertible, then this is supposed to be also what eta is. So this is a contradiction because, well, my symmetry operator is not trivial in particular. It's not supposed to be the identity. So what it means is that this operator cannot be invertible. And similarly, uh, as we already saw, if I do that for the dual symmetry, I have exactly the same. Uh, I have the, exactly the same contradiction. But this contradiction also gives us kind of the solution, which is that if I'm restricting, so here I'm assuming, uh, when I, I should clarify, when I write this mapping, since it's valid for all the i's, I'm assuming that I have periodic boundary conditions on either side. Otherwise, I would have to modify at some point the, the mapping. So here I'm assuming periodic boundary conditions. I see that this cannot be invertible because it actually sort of projects onto the even sectors. And so this also gives us a solution, which is that if we restrict to the even sectors of the respective symmetry on either side, then it is actually unitary. Um, so we do, we do recover, uh, we do have a unitary mapping, which is what we would expect from a duality. But so at, at first it seems that this is only uh, for uh, by restricting to even sectors, but the, the derivations we did before also give us the solution. We see that in order to access the other sectors, the odd sectors, we need to also allow for antiperiodic boundary conditions. Um, okay, so at the end of the day, what we have, so this was one, as I said, uh, one unitary mapping restricting to the even sectors, but we can get actually four of them by accommodating uh, interperiodic inter boundary conditions. So we have the, the following four mappings. So I've already written uh, one of them, well, two of them. So AP is interperiodic. And conversely, we have this. So what we have is that we should think of the Ising model as having four uh, sectors that we call topological sectors. These four sectors, it's a combination of boundary conditions, so periodic and periodic, and whether this is uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So four sectors, combinations of being periodic, interperiodic, and even or odd. And for every discriminant variability, map these sectors in a non-trivial way. And for every uh, combination of uh, compatible sectors, you can actually write this down as a unitary. Which means that if you look at the sort of the sort of the extended system where you, you, ex you, you make the boundary condition dynamical, which is something we will uh, explore later, and you look at the total Hilbert space where you can change the boundary condition, then you have a unitary mapping on the whole Hilbert space. Okay, and so to a large extent, uh, the goal of these lectures will be to explain how to explicitly construct these unitary mappings for more general type of, of dualities. So, so this is, you know, if you restrict the sector, this is not unitary, and this is because it's what people call non-invertible symmetry. Yeah, so the whole point is, so indeed, like, this is kind of, if I write this down, on a fixed Kepler space, 
it is non-invertible because it essentially projects uh, onto the event sectors on either side. But if you restrict on even sectors in the first place, then it is actually unitary. And so if you look at all possible combinations, at the end of the day, if I look at periodic, and periodic, and even and odd, here I have the total Hibbert space. And since I can write down unitaries for all possible sectors, I have a unitary on the total system. No, this understood. I want to ask the question that, so here you show nicely that even though symmetry is not invertible you can extend it to something unitary by mm -hmm. enlarging the framework yeah so the question was that whether it's can always be done so this will be the point of the lectures will be to show that given uh so next week we will see the the framework we use to classify symmetries so given some assumptions uh, regarding what kind of symmetries we allow so internal symmetries uh, i should say then we will, uh, I will explain how it can always be done, yes. Okay, so now the question is, uh, so to make this, uh, so this is kind of a nice uh, conceptual observation, but in practice, if you, if you want to make these dualities useful, and uh, I will explain some, some applications of these mechanisms uh, later, uh, you should be able to write this, this operation explicitly. You, you may want an operator that does this explicitly. Here I'm giving, I'm defining it kind of implicitly by its action, but you may want to have like an explicit expression for it such that you can apply it on any state you want in your, in your Hibbert space. Uh, and this is, uh, one, to some extent, one, one difficulty, which is to, to write these operators explicitly. So there is a, you can kind of brute force it and come up with a, and a formula involving this, this, opera, this spin operators, which is, which is quite ugly. No, so, which, uh, which operation? so I want to write down as a map from this keeper space to this one, I want to write down this operator explicitly. I want to have an explicit formula that tells me what this operator is. Oh, but the picture here isn't good enough, just take 0, 0, 1, 1 and then put Every time you see. At the end of the day, this is what we do. It's not so obvious to see, like, if you want to write it down in, like, I don't know, in terms of matrices or whatever, it's not so obvious. Uh, and so there is a somewhat ugly way of, of doing it. Uh, I'm going to present it in a, in, in a specific way, which is the language we're going to use uh, through, throughout this lecture. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to write down, so it's a small uh, uh, parenthesis. I'm going to write down these operators, and generally speaking, symmetry and duality operators as uh, matrix product operators. So short end is MPO. Okay. So what are these? So these matrix product operators uh, Consider a special class of so-called tensor networks. But tensor networks essentially, what, what are they? Is like you, you take some, you have a collection of, of tensors, so you think of multidimensional matrices, and then uh, they live on a specific graph, and the graph dictates in which way you multiply these tensors. So you multiply them along some indices and you end up with a, uh, it's a, it's a very graphical way of, of writing down uh, well states or operators or even numbers, for instance. So I'm going to, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm going to focus on one specific class of, of such tensor operators, that's these matrix product operators. And in general, these are defined as follows. So let's say you have a vector space. Okay, so I have a d-dimensional, so I have a local Hilbert space which is d-dimensional, and then I take n copies of this, uh, of this vector space. And then I'm considering on this vector space uh, a collection, a collection of matrices. Uh, of, so square matrices, chi by chi matrices. which are indexed by two labels, J and K, and they both run from 1 to D.
Okay. So here J and K are not the indices of the of the matrix. Huh? These are index uh, the matrix. So for a given G and K, I have a, I have a certain matrix. Okay. Now we call an MPO. So an operator from so my from my vector space to itself of the following form. So let me write it down and then try to explain a little bit what it means. So I'm summing over, uh, so all these indices have range uh, D, right? Okay, so I have a trace of matrices. And here I have the, the operator part. I'm using this bracket uh, notation. So this on its own represents uh, an operator, and this operator is weighted by some coefficient, which is given by the trace of all these matrices, and a sum over all possible configurations of J and K. Yeah. Is there a continuum space analog of these things? Are they the defect operators on these two? Or? So there is. So you're asking like whether I can some, take some continuum limit of this, and this would give me the symmetry operator. So it's a bit. So there is a continuous version of, of this, indeed. It is not so easy to actually relate them to take the continuum limit of one to, to get the to take the other. Um, I, I suppose. I, I mean, this is one question we have, which we haven't really uh, tried to address. Uh, but I, I could imagine that, yes, generally speaking, the topological defects, you could write them down as some continuous version of the MPOs. But it's not so, it's not so easy in, in, in practice uh, to, uh, especially to go from the lattice to the continuum. Yeah. But at this point, to complete any operator, it doesn't have to be symmetric. Oh, yeah, yeah, this is completely generic. No, but yeah. in itself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, no. This, I mean, indeed, there was no relation a priori between this and symmetry defects or it just it would just so happen that the symmetry operators can be nicely written down in this language but this language is not specific to symmetries yeah i mean the only reason i'm asking is like you're mapping you're going from one hilbert space to another and the only other things i know that do this in a continuum i think are just the defects mm -hmm. i see yeah so this will actually provide us also the so right now I'm going to write actually the duality operators uh, like this. Symmetries being a special type of duality in a way. Um, okay. So now, so this is as you can see, it's a, it's a formula that is not so easy to it's not so easy to grasp. Uh, so even though I haven't chosen specifically the M's yet, I mean it, it is a, not so easy to understand how these operators act. Um, but there is a nice graphical calculus or graphical depiction of these operators that we will employ as much as possible. Okay. So the graphical way of depicting this operator is as follows. First of all, I need to depict graphically an object, which is a four-valent tensor. And this four-valent tensor represents really, so here I have four indices, right? It's like once I specify these two indices, I'm left with a matrix. This matrix is a chi by chi matrix. So I have in total kind of four indices. And the idea is that I can represent this object as, uh, as a four-valent tensor. 
So in the tensor network language, what we do is that we represent the tensors by a blob. So the form, the shape of it doesn't matter. Here, take some circle. And then the legs here represents the possible indices. So explicitly, how, the, how you should understand this object is as follows. So I have two types of indices. Okay. Now I'm going to write down a complex number, which is the entry of the corresponding tensor. And there is the operator. So this, this object here, this is the way I'm depicting the entry so the AB entry of the matrix labeled by JK. Okay. So this specify a matrix, then I'm picking a specific entry. So this is a complex number. Okay. And then this represents, so you can think of an operator kind of both ways, either like vertically or horizontally, uh, depending. So then given this definition, I can write down the MPO explicitly. So four periodic boundary conditions, which I'm going to represent with these lines like this. I can write it down like this. Okay, so I put n of them, which is the size of my system. Okay, I have periodic boundary condition. So if you just kind of plug in uh, the formula, you will see that along these, these lines, which you can think of like kind of the identity matrix connecting the two tensors, you will have to use the inner product between these, uh, between these states. So you will identify the corresponding index. Then since you sum over them, this will take care of the matrix multiplication along the indices of the corresponding tensor. So all the horizontal ones are summed over. So here I'm, I'm taking periodic boundary condition. So this is the trace part uh, at the end. This is why I'm taking the trace. And then you're left with this open indices. So in the sense, you have these legs which are here uh, unlabeled. Then there is a sum over the corresponding JK, and there is something, there is an operator like this. So at the end of the day, it is indeed an operator from this vector space to itself. Uh, well, AB and GK are different here with this. Yes, in general. So in the, so in the tensor network literature, we usually refer to the vertical ones as sort of the physical, uh, it's, called, it's called bonds or like physical degrees of freedom because these are really the ones that are going to, that correspond to the physical hyperspace. These horizontal ones, these are often referred to as virtual ones, in the sense that they don't, they don't really have a, a physical interpretation uh, typically. Uh, and this can be indeed in different, uh, they, have, they can have different range and they are yeah, these are different on different uh, vector spaces. Um, okay, so I think uh, maybe we can take a break now and then I will explain how we can use that language in order to write down explicitly the, the Kramers venue operators. So I could write down, uh, I could write down a formula for the M that is going to give us the duality, the Kramers venue duality operator. But as it turns out, it's actually uh, much easier to write it down itself as a small uh, tensor network. Um, so for now, for, for in order to do that, I'm going to introduce two, uh, two classes of tensors, which are the simplest ones you can, can write down. I'm going to define this tensor, which is like with a black uh, dot. It's a swivelon tensor. The indices are all, you can take a value either zero or one. The entries of these tensors, so this is what we call a Kronecker delta tensor because it has only two vanishing, two non-vanishing entries. Um, it's, a, it's one when all the entry, when all the indices are zeros and it's also one when all the indices are one. Okay, so I can rewrite these entries are just two Kronecker deltas, like this. And I, I want to think of it as a, 
as an operator in a specific uh, direction, so I'm using the bras and kets uh, accordingly. Uh, so in the quantum information literature, this would be referred to as a GHD uh, state. Uh, so very explicitly, uh, this is something that looks like that. It just, it, it's a GHD state, but I think of it as a, in a you know, funny vector space where I have some, I treat some indices as vectors and covectors. Can I ask a question about the notation? Yeah. Like, why is there a sum? Like, are you tracing over it or is it a tensor? So here, this is the same as, you know, if you write down a, a, like a matrix, I can write it down as the sum of its entries where each entry corresponds to a specific mapping of of a vector to a covector, right? So here, this is the same idea, right? I'm just like, I'm listing all the possible, uh, all the possible entries. Yes, the point of this notation is also like, you see now, if I literally plug in the formula I have above in there, then it makes sense. It takes care of the multiplications in a nice way, and like you don't have, the, the sums will become the matrix multiplications. Yeah. So this is the first one, and the second one, which is actually, it's, uh, Fourier transform dual. So it's written as a plus. So this is a this is notation that I'm borrowing from quantum information. So this one is non-vanishing whenever the sum of the indices is zero modulo two. So I'm going to write this like that. But the square brackets will represent the sum modulo two. You can also think of it as just the multiplication in the group uh, Z2, which this is what we will do eventually. Uh, and this, yeah, okay. So now using these two tensors, I can write down explicitly my M and then the duality operator. So the M on its own, it looks like this. It's the following combination. Where I'm, the lines are, the vertical lines will, will not be aligned because ultimately this will represent the fact that I'm going from a Hubert space on integer size to half integer size, so I have this shift by half a side. It doesn't really matter as, 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 as far as this object is concerned, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to draw it uh, like this. So now putting these together, how does the operator look like? We have something like this. So this is, uh, so I'm just applying the definition. So alternatively, I have these black and plus tensors. Okay. And still, uh, I'm working with periodic boundary conditions. So I'm claiming that this operator does the job. This is the operator that does the mapping we wrote down before. And this follows from two properties. Well, two collections of properties, which are kind of symmetry properties of these tensors. So the first one is this one. If I multiply along all the indices with sigma x operator, I'm leaving the tensor invariant. So why is that? This is only non-vanishing when all the indices are equal, either 0 or 1. The sigma x operator effectively swap between 0 and 1. So if I have an unvanishing entry, swapping all of them will still give me, it will give me the other unvanishing entry. So it's fine, it will be 1 anyway. And if uh, they are not equal, when this is, this is going to be 0 uh, in any case. In the same spirit, I have symmetry properties involving the sigma z operators. So I have three of them. For any, for uh, I can take any any two uh, indices and I have a symmetry with respect to them. For a similar reason, since it's only non-zero whenever the indices are all the same, if I apply Pauli z operators, it might give me some minus ones, but it will always give me two minus signs, and therefore the minus ones will always cancel. 
and this will be uh, equal. And the, the plus tensor, as I said, because it's the Fourier transform dual actually of the, of the, of the other one, it satisfies the same properties but with the Pauli Z operators. So with respect to the Pauli Z operators. Yeah. So, so if I write down, so the Fourier transform of Z2, of the group Z2, is performed by this Hadamard matrix, which satisfies the following property. Uh, H sigma X gives me sigma Z. So this tensor is actually this tensor where I apply the Fourier transform on all the legs, this Hadamard matrix. So from this formula, you can immediately deduce uh, all this. Um, Well, like, so like the, like the usual group Fourier transform, so it, you can use it to trade a function of group variables into a function of representations of the group. Which in that case, you know, if you apply H on zero, it gives you the plus state. So it's really just a change of basis between poly Z and poly X in that case. Yep, nothing. Uh, um, Okay, and so now using uh, these properties, we can actually confirm that it does uh, what we want. So let me just uh, remind you of what is it we are after at the end of the day, is that we are after a mapping like this. I'm gonna drop the, the tau notation because this is, was just to kind of make the distinction between the spin and taus, but uh, the, the spin and domain words, but at the end of the day, it's, we are after a mapping of, of poly operators of this form. From one Hibbert space to the other. And we can check almost visually that this operator does the job. Um, so, why is that? So, let's say, so I think of this operator as acting, so my original Hibbert space is at the bottom, the new one is gonna be at the top. So, these are the integer sites. So, if I take, for instance, uh, two sigma z, so I'm gonna take, if I act with two sigma z's over there, right? Then I can use my symmetry properties. So in particular, I can sort of get rid of this, bring them over here, right? So I'm using uh, one of the, so I'm using this, uh, the combination of this and these properties, and then I'm using this one. So I can remove them from here and bring it over here. So ultimately, we have this mapping from two sigma z's on one side on the integer side to one sigma z on the half integer side. By duality, uh, exactly the same will happen uh, for the x. So if I take, um, let me just add uh, one, one side over here. If I take a sigma x, it's the same but backwards. I can replace it by these two sigma x's over there. And then I can use this combination of these two properties in order to have two sigma x on, on that side. Okay. So this operator gives me, uh, as I said, if I restrict on even sectors, this is the unitary operators that does the, that, that implements uh, Kamer's value. Using this operator, we can also uh, check explicitly that this operator indeed um, projects onto the even sectors. Uh, so specifically, uh, what I mean by this, I mean that we have this following property that the Kramers value operator kills so the dual symmetry on, on, on one side and the original symmetry on the other side. Uh, so let me briefly uh, redo a chunk of the, of the duality operator. So this you can verify it explicitly, exactly as before. Uh, so let's say on the uh, on so the origin, the, the dual symmetry, which was with respect to uh, the Pauli, uh, I don't remember, uh, the Pauli Z's. So if I take a product of Pauli Z's on that side, so you, you, you act on all the sides, 
Then I can use the same property. So I remove them from here. I bring them down there. And so on. And then they will all cancel two by two using the property, uh, uh, using the, using the, pro uh, sorry. Yes, using the property of the, this last property there of the black tensor. So you can do this similarly with the poly X on the other side. So it annihilates the symmetries, um, or rather it's kind of absorbed the symmetry. And this is the, it's just another way of saying that it projects onto the even sector on, on both sides. Uh, so yeah, yet, yet, uh -huh. yet another way to see it is that, let, let's say I have indices here, my, my spin is ABC. What you see is that on the other side, the state over here is going to be A plus B, so modulo 2, huh? uh, B plus C, and so on. So you get a very specific state where the sum of the corresponding uh, 0 and 1 is always going to be 0. This is another way of saying that you have to be in the even sector. So we get a specific uh, configurations. Actually, this we sort of knew it from the beginning, because if you think in terms of domain wall, you see immediately that both 0 and 1 and 1, 0 give, give you a domain wall. So you don't have a one-to-one -one correspondence between spin configurations and domain wall configurations, since different spin configurations give you the, will give you the same domain wall configuration. So there was no way it was going to be invertible already from... from uh, we could have guessed that from the beginning. OK, so now, uh, so this is one operator. Now let me write down the, the other three. Uh, and there is a, an equally compact way of, of doing that. So I'm just going to add something to my operator. which essentially is going to accommodate uh, the, the various boundary conditions. OK, so something like this. Uh, OK, so here I'm, th I'm thinking of the kind of boundary condition uh, taking place uh, over here. So by that, I mean that this is the site N. This is the site 1, so this is the site n plus 1 half, and this is the site 1 half. Okay, so this is where I chose the boundary condition to be. It doesn't really matter. It's arbitrary, but I, I chose it to be here. Um, so to accommodate for boundary conditions, I'm going to sneak in a matrix over here on this bond. So as I said, you can think of these lines as being essentially the identity matrix. It's like it's, well, it's just matrix multiplication, so it's like a Kronecker delta, essentially. But I can sort of twist uh, this uh, multiplication by putting a matrix here. And depending on the choice I make, uh, so in the spirit of what we, we use uh, explicitly, this, this is something of this form. Uh, so this is, this represents just the matrix entry. Uh, and then it's, uh, I can think of it as an operator like that. Um, so depending, uh, I'm, I have four, uh, I'm looking for four different operators uh, for the corresponding mapping of sectors, and this will correspond to four different choices of B. So let me write down uh, these four choices. So to go from even to even, so this is the case we, we've done, uh, we did above. So this is just B is the identity, so I'm, I'm not modifying anything. So, so but where is the trace state? And the trace is taken right up to B, right? It doesn't, you can take the trace pretty much where, so here the trace I'm taking it, uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter, right? I could, I could rotate everything. The trace is a rotation environment. <laughs> the, the site one appears on Yeah, maybe indeed the word site one should have been here, but I wanted to put the boundary condition not on the edge actually so that it's easier to visualize, yeah. Um, okay, so then the second one. So I'm just giving you the solution, then I will, I will explain one of them why this is the case. So this is always going to be some combination of poly operators. OK, and the last one, from enta periodic odd to enta periodic odd. 
going to be the product sigma z and sigma x. So let's just do one example. So for instance, let's do uh, I don't know this one from n periodic even to periodic odd. So my operator, I'm just redrawing some of it. Um, okay, uh, and I'm gonna put the sigma x over here. Okay, so I'm I'm doing a finite uh, version. Okay. So let's see it does the job. So there are several ways of seeing that it does the job. Um, first of all, we can check that now, the so I, I drew earlier the configurations of kind of spin configurations we see on one side, and we see that these are only compatible with like even, so these are even spin configurations. Here we can see that it's gonna be uh, odd. So one way to see it is that, let's say I have, you know, this, this is a state, so this can be either zero or one here. I'm making this choice. As I said before on the other side, here this will have to be a plus b. This one, so how does that work? Since it's a delta tensor here, it has to be c everywhere. This is, has to be b everywhere. But here this sigma x, well, it's gonna swap the c. So actually here I have c plus one modulo two. And so here it's gonna become b plus c plus one modulo two. But here this one is gonna be a plus c. So now we see that the sum actually of these indices now it's always going to be odd, because they will always cancel two by two, but there is this previous one. So this is indeed compatible with having the odd sector. What we can check as well is that the, the so I'm claiming that this is the operator that maps enter periodic boundary condition to periodic boundary condition. So this has also to take care of this. So enter periodic boundary condition. Uh, I don't actually remember if I wrote down the Hamiltonian uh, explicitly, but we said that it corresponds to identify, uh, instead of, of saying that sigma z n plus one with sigma one, it's gonna be sigma one z. It will be like a minus one. In fact, we twist before identifying them. So if I take here enter periodic boundary conditions, I have sigma z with a minus one on, on one side, okay? Then I use my, my rules so that I have upstairs, like above. So this sigma z, I can remove it here. This one, uh, oh, sorry, I can put it there. And then here I have to use the anti-commutation relation between sigma z and sigma x. So it's gonna produce a minus one, which will cancel the one I have over here. And, and then I have a single sigma z. Okay, so we see that it also takes care of the anti-periodic boundary condition. Do you still have the relation that eta hat kw equals kw eta? So, also the, the, the signature, right? yeah, so in, in, indeed, but so you just have to be, yeah, yeah, I mean, this is always true. Uh, but the sector now is different, right? Because here you have, you're actually in the odd sector on, on, on one side. But it's just I mean, before when you were showing that relation that eight. Ah, yeah, there was. There, no, you're right. You're right. Yeah, yeah. There will be a minus one. Indeed, there will be there will be minus one because now we are not in the same sectors. So here I'm 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 saying that be, before it was even even. So then you the fact that you absorb the operator was the fact that we were even even. Now I'm gonna have be be odd on one side. Okay, so you will always have so in that relation between there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have an analogous relation. Yeah. Because you will have to do the anti-commutation relation here. Yeah. Is, that, is that last one right? It's anti-periodic odd to anti-periodic odd. Yeah. So then it's so then you have sigma z, sigma x. So they will both. So the the, the boundary, the anti-periodic boundary condition on one side will will be with the term sigma x, sigma x. On the other side, it will be sigma z, sigma z. So in any case, you know you will have one of for each, right? So. It will, uh, yeah, it will deal with both, uh, it kind of factorizes it, so it will deal with both uh, uh, separately, sort of, yeah. Is it also, is there, a, is there a fusion algebra type thing? For these operators? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so I indeed, what I could do is that I could, uh, so as I said, my operator is not quite invertible, but I can consider the opposite operator. I can stack both of them. 
And what you see is that then it literally just gives you the projector onto the event sector, right? Um, and this is related to the fact that, you know, at the critical point, you have kind of an emergent, uh, the commerce value self-duality becomes sort of a symmetry, but it's actually more subtle than this. Like, strictly speaking, you don't quite have on the lattice uh, the ising, uh, uh, you know, the, the ising operators, they don't quite give you a symmetry because you have some subtleties relating to the, some, some shift by, uh, by half a site. Uh, Another question. Um, you never talked about shift operators on this lattice. Is that something that's worth playing with? Um, usually, I mean, like that's the thing that coming to your Hamiltonian and so on. And yeah, I mean, so you can define the translation operator, which 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 needs to be uh, which has to be kind of twisted uh, when you have different boundary conditions. Uh, so this is something we will, not exactly in that language, but when I define more generally these, these twisted boundary conditions, the fact that these are twisted by topological operators will imply that you have, you can sort of shift your boundary condition from one side to the other. So we will kind of implicitly, explicit, like implicitly define this twisted translation operator. Yeah. So what yeah. happens if I start from say periodic odd and apply this operator with the equal side mm -hmm. So the point, well, so it depends a bit on like, so if you fix really, uh, so as I said, ultimately you want to think of this boundary condition as being like kind of dynamical degrees of freedom. So then you take like the total Hibbert space and then these maps, you can, you can promote them to like one big operator, which always, always is unitary, right? Uh, so the point is that if you don't pick, if you don't have the right operator for the right combination of sectors, uh, but it's just going to give you zero because my operator, for instance, the, this operator, in particular, it is a projector onto the event sector on both sides. So if you start from something that you know is in the odd sector, then it's just going to give you zero. Yeah. Um, okay. So now uh, what I want to do is, so this way, the, the way we derive this Kramers linear transformation is a bit, it's kind of a bit specific to the Ising model. It was a bit like ad hoc, and we would like maybe a more general way of understanding this. And the route toward this more general understanding is to rephrase the kramers vanier duality as a gauging of its global symmetry. So I'm going to uh, so redo uh, some of the derivations we did earlier, but from the point of view of gauging the symmetry. And this approach actually uh, generalizes uh, better, and in particular in higher dimensions, uh, you can easily uh, employ the, the analog of this in higher dimension. Um, okay, so the Hamiltonian, um, so I'm going to write the, the initial Hibbert space that we had, I'm going to, to think of it as a kind of a matter a Hibbert space, so it's, it's the same Hibbert space like before, but I want to think of the initial degrees of freedom as a matter uh, degrees of freedom. And so the Hamiltonian, let me just reproduce it quickly here. So for periodic boundary condition, what's this one? Okay. And the symmetry, more, more importantly, the symmetry was with respect to the poly X operator. So I want to gauge that symmetry. So what it means, it means I want to make this symmetry local. So here the symmetry acts on all the degrees of freedom at once. I would like to be able to have a theory that is invariant when I sort of act only on, on, on one side instead. And so the way to do that, so it's like a several step uh, process. The first step consists in adding new spin one half degrees of freedom, which you can think of it as a gauge field on the edges, on the other links. Yeah? So the half integer sites, if you want. So now I have a new uh, Hibbert space, like a total Hibbert space, which is a tensor product of my initial matter uh, Hibbert space, and what I will call the, the gauge Hibbert space. So this gauge Hibbert space is just tensor product on the half integer sites.
Okay. The second step is to define so-called GARS operators, which will enforce this local version of the symmetry. So what does it look like? So I have my sigma x, which is kind of the, the local version of this operator. But then this uh, sort of gauge transformation also acts on the neighboring gauge degrees of freedom. With, poly, with the, so I'm, I'm using again this, this tau x to make the distinction clearer. Just saying that this local version acts simultaneously on a matter degrees of freedom and the neighboring gauge degrees of freedom. And so in particular, what we have is that this, which is important, they commute uh, for all sets. Which means that I can impose, ultimately, I will be able to impose this condition everywhere. So now I want a Hamiltonian that commutes with this uh, gauge transformation. This will be my gauge Hamiltonian. So we require a Hamiltonian that commutes. With all the GIs. Okay. And this is done by this procedure, which is called the minimal coupling. So the idea here is to modify the original Hamiltonian in a way that is as minimal as possible. So you just add what you need in order for the original Hamiltonian to commute with these class operators. Uh, it can be formulated in a more precise way, but for today it will be enough to stick to this heuristic. So I'm calling this resulting Hamiltonian the gauge Hamiltonian. And it looks, it looks like that. So I added here a gauge degree of freedom. This will ensure that we have the commutation uh, with the gas operators. The sigma x, they, they commute uh, already on their own, so I don't need to do anything. And I'm exp even, so I'm, even though I'm working with periodic boundary conditions, I'm explicitly uh, writing down the term associated with the boundary condition. Okay, so this you can check, it, it commutes with all the operators. So at this point, as before, we have to choose boundary conditions for the gauge field as well. I haven't specified so far, but every time we work on a closed boundary conditions, we have to specify whether it's periodic or anti-periodic. So let's say, uh, uh, let's suppose that uh, this is periodic. And we will see the consequence of that in a second. So this is periodic yeah, for the gauge field. So now I'm periodic basically for both gauge field and the original degrees of freedom. And the next step is to impose. So I'm impose, I would say kinematically, the gas constraint. What it means is that I'm only considering, so I'm defining a new Hibbert space, which I'm calling called physical. And to assume that tau n plus one z equals tau one half z. So for the so I, so ultimately the, the the boundary condition. So we already saw that before, but that maybe I didn't write it down explicitly. So the boundary condition uh, for the original model, it's this sigma z z term, which could be plus or minus one, whether it's periodic or periodic. For the dual model, it's gonna be the tau x. So it's going to be a tau x, tau x term, which can be plus or minus 1. So this is why I'm writing it down like this, because whether it would be minus 1, this would give us then the corresponding minus 1 in the gauge, the dual Hamiltonian. Um, 
it has to do with the fact that the symmetry is the dual symmetry, right? The original symmetry was with respect to sigma z, now it's with respect to tau x. And this is with the symmetry that is kind of twisted, this, twisting this boundary condition. So this is why you have kind of this, this change as well. Um, so I'm, what it means is that I'm restricting to, I'm only considering states that satisfy uh, the constraints. So that are in, that are in the, uh, I'm imposing uh, that, what it means is that I'm imposing that, I mean the plus one against states of this for all the i's, right? And so I'm restricting to states that, the, that satisfy this condition. And so therefore, once I impose this condition, since I have as many conditions as the number of sites, I end up with something, so I end up with a, an effective Hibbert space that, have, that has the expected dimension. So I have an effective Hibbert space, or, or rather, this physical Hibbert space is isomorphic uh, of, the, of the, the dimension is 2 to the n. Okay. But here the key observation is that if I'm imposing all these constraints, we notice in particular that the product of all these constraints, if you just work it out, it looks like this. So you have, so everything can off cancel two by two, but this term, which I'm, I'm highlighting it because depending on whether I'm working with periodic or interperiodic boundary conditions, this will either be plus or minus one. But since I chose periodic, then this is just eta, and I'm imposing this to be one. Huh? I'm imposing this constraint kinematically, so in particular, I, I'm imposing that the product is, uh, the, I'm, I mean, the plus one against states of the product, which means that I'm restricting, again, huh, to the even sector. So this is the so restriction to the even sector. So we recover what we saw before, the fact that the only thing that is compatible with having the dual model on periodic modality condition is that I was in the even sector in the first place. If I had chosen anti-periodic boundary condition, then I would have got a minus one here when I do this step, and therefore I would have been in the odd sector. Okay. So now the final step is, uh, so we, we are kind of done as far as the gauging is concerned. But when we do these operations of gauging, usually we don't stop uh, quite there. We want to rewrite the, the final model in a nicer way. We want to define an effective model where essentially we get rid of, if we can, the, the original degrees of freedom. And so right now we are at the stage where we have this mixture of both the initial degrees of freedom and the new ones, the matter and, and, and gauge degrees of freedom. Now what I want to do is I want to get, get rid of the matter degrees of freedom. So we're looking for an effective description. But I just put them right. So I want to I, I want to go from a pure matter theory to a pure gauge theory, in the spirit of the Kramers Vanier. I thought you want to show that this gauge model. I want to show that if I write down an effective description for this gauge model, I end up with the dual, the Kramers Vanier dual of the original model. But this is useless unless you show that your gauge model is actually equivalent to the original model. So this is, so at this point... You want to show that this gauge model can be... Indeed, at this point it's not completely obvious, it's not completely obvious that when you gauge a model you will end up with something that is related, okay. But it will. Uh, so it's not obvious from, from this procedure, but we will recover the dual model we derived before. We've already established the fact that there was a unitary mapping between the two. Uh, and, and more generally, we will see later that all these gauging procedures, the model you get by uh, doing this gauging procedure and going from not necessarily a pure matter to pure gauge field, but doing this process of gauging and then getting rid of as much degrees of freedom you can, uh, they will, or we will always be able to actually write down a unitary mapping in the same way we did the Kramers venue. But I agree, from this purely gauging procedure, it's not immediately uh, obvious. What makes it obvious is the fact that in fine, once I have, okay, this is my original Hamiltonian, this is the new one, I, ha I, I see the mapping I've done, I can actually write down a unitary operator that does that. In a way here, graphically, you can think of, of this as 
you sort of kind of insert your initial gauge degrees of freedom. And then kind of I'm tracing away the matter one and you can kind of reconstruct, we are basically reconstructing this lattice operator from this gauging procedure. Um, okay, so the effective description, the first thing to notice, so right now I'm just trying to guess, basically recover the dual model. So the first thing I can do is that when I'm restricting to the physical Hubbard space, this term is equal to the one we have in the original Hamiltonian, which is just, we have just this sigma x term. So when restricting to the Hubbard space, we have this equality. And this is just because the Gauss, this is the definition of the Gauss constraint, which um, let me just show them. If you just look at the gas constraint, if you force this to be one, it gives you an equality uh, of operators. And then what we can do is that we can define what we call a, a unitary map, which is going to disentangle the matter degrees of freedom and uh, the matter degrees of freedom. I'm going to, to give its expression, but I will leave to an exercise to compute how it actually acts. So I'm introducing this uh, operation which I write C sigma x. Uh, it's, so this is what we call a controlled uh, gate in the quantum information literature. I will just give its definition. So it's an operator that acts on two sides, actually. So here, both an integer side and a half integer side. And in general, the way it's defined, so the, the action on this operator on the side i and j oh, it looks like this. So it takes the state and it acts sometimes with a sigma x operator or sometimes with the identity depending on the state the, the, at, the, at the first site. Right? So it's, like an, it's an action by a sigma x operator that is conditional by the, the value of, 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 the, of A here for this state. This is what we call a control gate uh, in, in quantum information. And you can show that. So it's a, it is a unitary operator. You can convince yourself of that. And uh, you can show that if you, uh, so let me write it down there. That if I apply, so first of all, if I apply to this, on. What does this sigma j x to the power a, so a is equal to zero, 1? So sigma j x is the party x acting at side j. Yeah. And a, so here I'm, this is why it's kind of a... Is it just uh, the power? Because a, yeah, it's a is either 0 or 1, so I really think of it as to the power of 0 or 1. Okay. Yeah. This is, yeah. Um, and so I can check that the commutation relation, so the way this operator acts on the gas operator, is as follows. And so therefore, if, since I'm imposing kinematically uh, these guys to be satisfied, then it means, after I've done this mapping, it means I'm basically projecting all my method degrees of freedom. I force them to be in one specific state, so they kind of become classical, and I can forget about them, because they're all forced to be in the plus one against state of this operator. So in that case, it's a case where we can get rid of actually all the matter degrees of freedom. And similarly, if I act on this state, so the state that is in the, the gauge Hamiltonian, the first uh, part of the gauge Hamiltonian, I get something like this, which is so compatible with the fact that we can get rid of all the matter degrees of freedom. And so ultimately, I found a dual Hamiltonian, which is, okay, it's just the dual, uh, the kramers vanier dual, which I will rewrite one more time. And so here again, I, I chose periodic boundary conditions for the gauge field, but I could have chosen interperiodic, which would then have restricted the initial model to be in a given sector. Uh, I'm a bit confused. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of algebra, but physically, you know, we have this spin star. Yeah. 
why can't you just say something much simpler that you just rotate this skin style until they point in the same direction on all sides? That's basically, that's essentially what this disentangling map does. It's like I'm, I'm, I'm we working in a different basis yeah. where ultimately this gas law and all, it just amounts to, to fixing the matter degrees of freedom to be a given value. Matter of age. So the matter degrees of I'm, I'm trying to get rid of the matter degrees of freedom. So I'm, I'm, I'm starting from a pure matter theory. So you, you see that we want to go from, like just visually, right? We, we want to go from, let's say, a pure matter theory on the sides. And then ultimately we're interested in a, in a theory that has only degrees of freedom on the half integer side. So I'm placing kind of my gauge field on the half integer side. I'm resolving all the gas laws which allows me to kind of trace away the initial matter degrees of freedom. And I'm only left with a theory that is on the, on the half integer sides. Okay, yeah. good. But why can't you also perform a, the opposite operation, which is to set all the gauge field point in one direction? Wouldn't you then recover the original model? Yeah, you could do that, but I don't want to do that. I want to, okay, I want to go... An explicit way to demonstrate that actually the two models are equivalent. Yeah, that's yeah. Sure, sure. That you, yeah, yeah. I, so the, indeed, like so here, it's especially symmetric. So it looks exactly the same regardless of the way you do it. If you do it from the point of view of the gauge field of the matter degrees of freedom, I guess here I'm doing it in this way to kind of highlight to really go from like a mapping from a Hilbert space that is defined only on the on the sides to a Hilbert space that is defined on the half integer sides. No, but the reason why I'm confused is because you said oh, but. Then, you know, once we fix this gauge, then we still have to go back to our original construction, which shows the equivalent, but that's kind of self defeating Well, not, yeah, I mean... To gauge fix in two I, different ways. Like, there is... You can do it in a way where you, as I said, you literally reconstruct this operator. Like, if I'm doing it in a way where I can, I can rewrite everything as a kind of circuit, where I'm first inserting uh, some new degrees of freedom, like, in, let's say, in a given state, and then I'm kind of coupling them with the new general method degrees of freedom. Then I can write down the kind of an operation that does this projection where you, well, that you enforce the gas constraint. And you can, there, there is a, a way to actually recreate these operators more systematically from the procedure I described. I'm here indeed, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of relying on the fact that we've already established the fact that there was a unitary mapping. I'm just trying to re-motivate in different, but if I had just done the gauging, then indeed I would have, uh, you, yeah. yeah try to prove explicitly from this gauging procedure that this was unitary. Okay, so that's it for the, for the Ising model. Uh, maybe just like in a... Like yeah. The steps here. You, you apply the symmetry map to the Hamiltonian and you get it. Yeah, so ultimately, indeed, uh, then in, I, ultimately I apply this disentangling map to the original, to the gauge Hamiltonian, yeah. and I end up, I call this the resulting Hamiltonian. Okay, so in the last, uh, let's say, 10 minutes, I just want to, 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 to give a, a feel for what we're going to do in the next uh, lecture. So to some extent, we're going to consider um, the remaining lectures will be about considering, I would say, more or less arbitrary uh, lattice models that have given symmetry structures. Yeah. Before we, before we move on from the example, uh, what role did the coupling constant play in this story? No, uh, because I'm not particularly interested in, uh, I would say, I, I, I'm not particularly trying to rewrite the dual Hamiltonian in terms of the original one for a different coupling constant, which would be relevant if you try to identify some safe dual point or whatever. Here, I'm not particularly interested in this. Uh, but indeed, you can see that, uh, well, if I take the dual Hamiltonian, if I, if I had done a change of basis, so if I had swapped tau z for tau x, it would be exactly the same Hamiltonian as the initial one, if not for the fact that the, the kappa is, uh, is in front of the wrong term. So then you can... So since the kappa is, seems to be in front of the wrong term, should I think of uh, the ratio between the two coefficients as yeah, yeah, so then usually what you do is that you factor out the, the kappa, so then you get, you get exactly, so if not for this prefactor, you get exactly the original Hamiltonian, but with the coupling being one over kappa instead of kappa. So that's 
this is the strong weak duality, and then you see that the self dual point has to be when when it's one, basically when they match. Right? Uh, okay, so um, I don't, I, I'm not going to to do it today, but so more generally, what what would be the goal of these lectures? Would be to write down lattice model. So in the spirit of the Azing model, you can think of it as some some, some generalization of the Azing model, which will have a uh, a more exotic type of symmetries. So I will consider um, a very uh, general class of, of, of symmetries. And, and, and one way to, to motivate uh, sort of the need for this more general class of symmetries is that what I could do is that I could define a finite group version of the Ising model. Like right now, I, I, I write down the Ising model in a way where, okay, it has a Z2 symmetry. Uh, and I can ask for what is like a very similar looking Hamiltonian that would now have a symmetry with respect to any finite group. And if you do exactly the same procedure, uh, so in the case of the finite group generalization, I will briefly uh, sketch it uh, next time. So in the case of a finite group generalization, what we will find is that we start from a Hamiltonian, which will be G symmetric, so it will have a just uh, it will commute with operators labeled by group elements uh, in G, like uh, exactly in the same way as for the Ising model, they are labeled by, you can think of it like labeled by group elements of, of Z2. And the dual model will have what we call a rep G symmetry. So this is something that is kind of familiar from a gauging procedure, actually, is that if you start from a theory that has an ordinary, uh, I would say, ordinary invertible symmetry with respect to a group, the dual model has what we call a RepG symmetry in the sense that the Hamiltonian will commute with operators that are not labeled by group elements, but they are labeled by irreducible representation of the group. So we got a taste for that in the fact that at some point I said that I should, I think of the dual symmetry of the Ising model as being the pointer eigen dual of Z2. Uh, because I had this trade-off from, I went from like a symmetry in terms of sigma x and in terms of sigma z, and these are like free transform of each other. You have something analogous when you have a, a non-abelian group. Uh, but now, uh, so what replaces really the, the, the Ponte Hagen dual is the fact that I have symmetry operators that will be labeled by really irreducible representation of my group. These symmetries will be non-invertible. This is something we will discuss uh, next time. And, uh, this invites us to consider a more general class of symmetries that would accommodate both this type of symmetry and this at the same time. And using this, uh, this framework, we'll be able to essentially redo what we did today, which is to, to do some kind of generalized gauging procedure, uh, end up with a model that can look very different from the initial one, and see that when you actually look at all the possible sectors, you can write this operation as a unitary operation. And ultimately, I will talk about how this can be useful uh, to numerically simulate uh, symmetric phases of matter. And I think I will stop here for today. Thank you. If you have questions, feel free to ask. Is it essential that the group is finite? So, um, so, yes and no. Uh, so, in the sense that, at the end of the day, I'm going to work within the framework of fusion categories. So, this will come with all kinds of finiteness uh, conditions. So, then, you know, if it was not finite, it wouldn't fit within the framework I'm going to describe. Uh, and many results I'm going to use rely on the fact that I do have a fusion category. It doesn't mean that we, I'm not going to talk about Hamiltonians that have a continuous symmetry. So I, I will illustrate some demonstrations with like Heisenberg models that have like an SO3 symmetry, and that's fine. It's just that in that case, I will be looking at a duality that only involves some finite subgroup, but it doesn't mean I cannot talk about models that have a continuous symmetry. And morally, you can, uh, we can just sort of I mean, naively generalize what we do to, to the case of a continuous group. It's just it's not really on, on, on rigorous uh, footing, and there are certain aspects that don't quite work out. So it's like, for now, I would say, yes, we restrict to, to finite to finite group. And this is for, that's the procedure 
that you described works for general dimensional lattices. It's not restricted to one plus one. No, no. So as I said before, uh, so I would say as long as you have a good grasp on the corresponding mathematical structures, so this uh, would be like some higher fusion categories in higher dimension, then you can employ the same, exactly the same approach. Uh, where this kind of dualities then becomes quite more exotic because like if you take some, it's a two dimensional version of this, you would go from what we call like a zero form G symmetry to a one form rep G symmetry. So you have a, you trade also dimensions kind of when you do this gauging in, in higher dimensions. So there, is there some analog of this procedure of finding the dual, like is there, there's continuous analogs of all these things, right? Or not really? So yes and no. The fact that I'm working on the lattice here, Really, I mean, it, it seems, so this is something a bit maybe contradictory with the lattice, is the fact that in a way it seems simpler because you're thinking, okay, it's, uh, it's discretized and everything. But to be able to work on the lattice, I need to understand these objects like as well as possible. I really need to understand them in a very microscopic way. Uh, I need to access to certain specific data that I, I would list uh, next time. Uh, from a topological point of view, this, goes back to the fact that the corresponding topological field theory has fully extended, uh, which is not, not necessarily the case when you have a continuous group. So, so there are many, many technical points that are not very well under control if it's not, uh, if it's not finite. Yeah. Are, are we I, I, I thought the question was... Maybe I misunderstood the question, I don't know. Discrete group, but I guess you meant yeah, like continuum. Yeah, I meant like not lattice, as in like... Ah, continuum. my bad, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so then exactly, yeah, so this is this statement literally is the same in the continuous, right? Yeah, yeah. there was no problem there. Yeah, yeah. In, that case, in those cases, there's like these additional things like junction conditions and um, there's these identities that I guess G and M friends worked out for Kata for like uh, getting a list of consistent <coughs> Um, I guess defect offer or not defect, I don't know what you're calling it. Is there like analogs of these things in the lattice that we're going to work at? Yes, uh, I mean if I understood correctly what, what you mean, yes. So starting next week I will like lay out kind of the, the kind of mathematical structures uh, that we need and see explicitly how it works out on the lattice. Yeah. So you will, all these conditions you're referring to, they have, I mean if I... It doesn't translate between the two? I, not that I'm aware of, but I mean, it depends maybe if you have something very specific in mind or to, um. I guess in all those cases that I know, they, they, I don't know if they're looking at uh, finite group symmetries, that is, it's usually some Lie group or something, or whereas here, here. Yeah, so as I said, then if you leave the realm of, of finite groups, then there are, there are, there are complications. Yeah. But what happens to the F symbols and those kind of things if you have a continuous group? What, what, what are the indices and so on? No, this is kind of fine. I mean, like for instance, for SU2, uh, these are the suggest symbols, so, so we have them. What is more tricky is the fact that they are, so as we will see is that, so we will consider like more general types of dualities and the main question will be what is the resulting symmetry? What is the symmetry you get after doing this kind of generalized gauging procedure? Uh, and also how do you even, define the gauging procedure in, in general. If I have a non-invertible symmetry, what does it mean exactly to, to gauge it, right? Um, so, so, so the framework we're going to use, huh, we're gonna rely on this uh, sort of Morita theory of, of, of fusion category. Uh, this comes with like, uh, uh, things are only very well under control, I would say, within the realm, as I said, of like fusion categories and everything, or at least the examples, like if we want to work out things explicitly, uh, th this is within this, uh, this realm. Uh, so they are like these kind of key uh, steps, which I, I would not know how to do in the in the continuous case, for instance. So, so you can define back G when G is a Lie group. Well, not really. I mean, not really. <laughs> there is something analogous, like this called like category of skyscraper sheaves. I mean, there is like some some something that looks as closely as possible to it, but not not morally, no, not really. I mean, as far as I, as far as I understand, I would say, yeah. If there are no more questions, I mean, feel free to, uh, you're dismissed. <laughs> <laughs>